All right. So now that we've talked about uh, Newton's third law, let's now go back and talk about some other types of forces that we're going to see throughout the semester. And the last one we're going to see, that we're going to talk about for a little while, is what's called then the, uh, the friction force. Okay. So what's the friction force? So friction force is a force that opposes the motion of an object. And this force then basically acts when I'm trying to take an object here and then slide it, say, across another object. Now, in this case, the friction force will be parallel to the surface, as opposed to the normal force, which is always perpendicular to the surface. Now, in general, I'm going to have two different types of friction forces. The first one is what we call the static friction force. And then the second one is what's known as the kinetic friction force. So what's the difference between each one? So the static friction force is actually a friction force acting on an object that is not moving. So this is acting object, which is not moving. And then kinetic friction. So kinetic friction then is the friction force which is acting on a moving object. So this is the difference between the two. So static friction is when I have an object which is not moving, as opposed to the kinetic friction, which is then a friction acting on the object when it is in motion. Okay. So let's talk about the static friction first. The static friction then that F sub S for a static friction. This one is a little bit complicated. So this one is going to be somewhere between zero and some maximum quantity. Right. So first of all, how do I know that this thing has to have zero static friction? So for example, let's say I put my water bottle here. So here's my water bottle and I simply put it on the table. Then if I ask myself, what is the static friction which is acting on this bottle? So remember, what the static friction tells me is it's opposing something else. So in this case, I know it has to be somehow parallel to the surface here, which means it has to either be pointing in this direction or this direction, this direction, or some direction along parallel. But if I had a static friction force at the moment and nothing else is pushing on it from the other direction, so let's say in this case, my static friction force is pushing this way, what would happen? Well, in this case, I would have an unbalanced force where I'd have a static friction acting on the object, nothing pushing back on any other direction, which means this thing would start accelerating randomly across the table. Because so Newton's second law again says that's why. As long as I have an unbalanced force, I have to have an acceleration because this thing has a mass to it. So this wing would start accelerating across the table, which would be pretty awesome, but we don't ever see that happen. <laughs> so in this case, what this means then is that what? I know I have to have some sort of zero static friction. So in this case, there's no other forces pushing on it. So therefore, there has to be a zero static friction. Okay? So now what happens was, if I take the object and I now start to apply a force onto it, and I start to push it. So let's say I start pushing on this object. So initially, I push on it a little bit, so it doesn't really do much. And then I start increasing the force and increasing the force and increasing the force until eventually, this thing's about ready to do that, start moving. Okay? So in this case, what I know in this case then is what? Here it's zero. When I start pushing on a little bit, it increases and increases and increases and increases. So eventually it reaches exactly that maximum until eventually it kicks over then to kinetic friction. So static maximum friction or maximum static friction is just before this thing breaks over to the other type of friction, which is the kinetic friction, which is the friction it feels as this thing is sliding across the table. So in this case, it has a static friction. Because in this case, now it's moving, but I know it slows down and stops, which means it has to have a force in the opposite direction. It's moving, which is what we call that static or that kinetic friction. So again, this is kinetic friction. Pushing on it here, this is static friction. This is not moving. So <clears throat> this is where this maximum comes from. So the maximum comes from the fact that this is the greatest amount of friction force or the greatest amount of force I can push on it. So the greatest amount of friction force can be before this thing starts to move. Now it turns out this one has a maximum or a quantity associated with it. So the maximum static friction is then equal to mu sub s times the normal force. Where mu sub s here is what's known as the coefficient 
um, static friction. Very inventive name, I know. So in this case, now notice that by dimensional analysis, I have a friction force or a force on the left-hand side. So it has to have units of newtons. On the right-hand side, I have a coefficient times and the normal force, which also has units of newtons. So I have newtons on the left-hand side, newtons on the right-hand side, which means that this thing is a dimension upon quantity. And so this thing has no units to it. So coefficient of static friction has no units. Now be careful, be very, very careful when it comes to static friction, because it can be anywhere between zero and some maximum quantity. So when I do a problem, I can't automatically assume that it's always going to be maximum. There typically has to be something in the problem which implies to me that this thing is going to be maximum. And typically that's going to be in the wording of the problem, which will tell me if this thing is going to be maximum or something else. Okay. So <clears throat> this is then the static friction. Now, static friction is a little bit different because the object is not moving. So that means when we write down the direction of the static friction, we can't simply say, well, it's moving. So it has to be in the opposite direction of the moving. So what we say in this case then is that the direction of it is always in the opposite direction of the proposed motion. So it's direction here. Is opposite to direction of proposed motion. So let's go back to my water bottle here. So in this case, when I take my water bottle and I push on it this way, that means my static friction has to be in this direction because I'm trying to get it to move this way by pushing on it this way. Mm -hmm. But since it's not moving, my, my static friction is in the opposite direction to keep it then from moving. Mm -hmm. We'll draw some pictures here in just a second. <clears throat> just kind of illustrate this a little bit better. Now, kinetic friction. What is kinetic friction? So again, kinetic friction is, again, when this thing is moving. Ah, so in this case, when I find this thing across the table, stop it. Good, just like that. Good, as it slides across the table, this thing then is moving, so therefore it has a kinetic friction. So it turns out kinetic friction is actually just simply a constant. So kinetic friction, I'm gonna call that guy, blue here, F sub K for the kinetic friction is always equal to the use of K times the normal force. So this one is always simply a maximum, where mu sub K here is what's known as the coefficients of kinetic friction. Again, kinetics just means motion. So in this case, no coefficient. So this thing doesn't go to zero. It doesn't have a maximum value. It's simply always that value all the time. Yeah. Good. Now again, this guy is also dimensionless by the same reasons. On the left-hand side, I have what? A force. On the right-hand side, I have a force. So this thing has to be dimensionless. This is my coefficient. So typically, the coefficients are going to be some sort of material dependence quantity. Um, so both of these guys, so both uh, mu sub k and mu sub s, are material dependent. So what does that mean? So that means that the materials at which it is that it's finding across will basically overall end up determining what the coefficient is. So different materials will have different coefficients or different materials and how they're rubbing on other materials will then have different coefficients. Uh, other things are playing into account too. So for example, if I wax something, I could decrease the coefficients. If I froze it, I could decrease the coefficients. So basically things like that. But typically this is gonna be some sort of material dependent quantity. In most problems that you do, you're either going to be given a coefficient or it's something you'll have to solve for. Um, but again, since it's material dependent, that means there's not just one coefficient, but there's all kinds of different coefficients. So let's talk about each one again. So let's go back to static. Let's look at static friction. So what happens to the static friction? So with the static friction, let's say again, I have some mass. Here's my mass, and I'm going to push on the mass. Okay. So initially, if I only give a little tiny force onto the mass, so this is my little tiny force F, then my static friction then will be in the opposite direction at which I'm pushing on it in exactly the same size. Right? Because again, this thing has to be not going anywhere, which means that some of my forces on it, let's call this my x direction, 
must then be equal to zero, which means that my force applied minus my static friction force must then be equal to zero, which means the force I'm applying on it must be equal to my static friction force. Now, if I take that same box, and then I give it a bigger force, so now I'll apply a bigger force, I'll call that my applied force. In this case, my static friction force then grows to equal the same exact size as this force. And this will happen all the way until the point where the force that I apply on it reaches that of the maximum static friction force. So again, here I'm pushing on my block in this case, so that this becomes then my applied force. It's a little bit longer. And this will then be exactly the same length, we get just opposite direction, and this will be my maximum static friction. So this will be just before it kicks over then into kinetic friction. So what does this mean? So this means then if I plotted my static friction versus the applied friction, so in this case, this is my static friction versus the applied friction, uh, what ends up happening in this case then is that I get a simply linear straight relationship between the two. So eventually, these two things are the same. Okay, so this becomes equal to my maximum static friction force, and then this guy is going to be equal to my maximum static friction force. Right. So again, as I increase the applied force, my static friction force grows exactly the same amount because, again, the net force then must be equal to zero. Now, what about kinetic friction? I'll come back and put these plots together. So now let's look at kinetic friction. So for kinetic friction, since kinetic friction is actually a constant, what that means is if I took that same mass and I push on it with some force, let me call that guy F. So here's my F in this case. So this thing is now feeling a static or kinetic friction, say, in this direction. That kinetic friction. Now, if I in increase the size of that force, so that now I'm applying on it with this amount of force, actually what happens then is that the kinetic friction actually stays exactly the same size. It never changes size. It stays exactly the same the whole time because it's simply constant. Because again, my kinetic friction is equal to u sub k times the normal force. Now, the only way the kinetic friction will change is either if I change the coefficient or if I change the normal force. That's the only way I can actually change that. By me simply applying a greater force doesn't change the friction force. All it does is cause it to accelerate faster, which basically means that what? If I plotted this portion here, so the kinetic friction versus the applied force, what I would get in this case then is what? This thing stays in the containing constant line the entire time. This thing is as F sub k. So no matter how big or small I make that force, as long as it has started to move it and has broken uh, static friction, then this thing will act constantly the entire time. So what this means then is in a general situation where I have both of them, the total force then, at least the total friction force, I'm just going to write this as friction, again is going to do this. So in the first part, it's going to be static friction. It's going to increase, increase, increase until eventually, again, I reach my static friction force. And then once I break that static friction, it becomes, so if we think about something where I need to, again, push this water bottle, I have to take a lot of force to get it to move. But once it starts moving, it's easy for me to keep it moving under that same force, which means that basically what happens then is that the size of the friction force decreases going from static friction then to kinetic friction. So this thing then jumps over then to kinetic friction and then will maintain constants at that kinetic friction the entire time. This is, again, versus the applied force. So basically, for almost any realistic material, what is always going to be true is that the coefficient of static friction will always be greater than the coefficient of kinetic friction because the size of the maximum static friction is always greater than the size of the kinetic friction. Right? And since this is mu sub s times the normal force, greater than mu sub s times the, or sorry, mu sub k times the normal force. So the normal forces are simply going to cancel because they have the same normal force. And that means, again, mu sub s must be greater than mu sub k. Thank you for that.
There we go. <laughs> Good stuff, which again is just this expression here. Right. So again, what always happens is that my static friction, I mean, if I don't have a static friction, obviously, but and I have friction, but the maximum static friction will always be greater than the kin average kinetic friction, which is actually anything I've got there. But as I push on it, this thing then will, again, increase all the way to the maximum static friction. And then if I push on it just a little bit more, it'll break over and then move exactly that kinetic friction. Now, that's not to say that static friction is something which is always bad. So for example, or even kinetic friction, both of those two frictions don't always have to hinder something. Sometimes they can actually help the situation. So give you a good example. So if I got up, let me go ahead and get up. And I start walking around. Why can I walk around? Well, I can walk around because friction exists. And we know that's because, especially right now, if I went outside where everything is all nice and icy, especially over the last couple of days here, we know that's what, if I go outside and I try to walk, I'm just gonna start sliding and I'm not actually gonna feel anything, right? So in this case, I know that the reason I can actually walk is because of friction, right? The reason I can drive my car is because of friction. The reason I can turn a corner is because of friction. The reason I can go and stand on my roof and not fall off is because of friction. So the question now becomes, well, what kind of friction? So if I'm walking around here, what type of friction is actually acting on me, which is causing me to move? Now, this is a little bit tricky because obviously I'm moving, but we have to think about what is my foot doing relative to the ground? So when I put my foot down and I propel myself forward, is my foot sliding relative to the ground? Now, in this case, the answer is no. I mean, some people like to scuff their feet when they walk, which is what it is. But for the most part, when I take a step and I propel myself forward, it's actually static friction. And it's static friction because when I put my foot down, my foot doesn't slide relative to the surface. It is stationary, and I use that to propel myself forward, actually by Newton's third law. So what happens then is I'm trying to push this forward this direction, backwards, that's where my foot is pushing it. But then the four by Newton's third law pushes me forward, and that's what actually propels me forward because of that static friction. What causes my car to move forward? Well, again, static friction. So in this case, as my wheels are trying to rotate, they're not sliding relative to the ground itself. They're actually stationary, causing it to be propelled forward. And again, with my walking, I know that's true as well. As I'm walking, I'm being propelled because if it was kinetic friction, my foot would be doing this, and I'd be actually sliding out. It's better if I do my socks. So this is what would happen if I had kinetic friction. Okay. But since my feet are not sliding, then I know I have static friction. So that's what it's causing me to move forward. Same thing, if I'm driving my car and I try to turn through a corner, what's moving my car through the corner is, again, static friction. So I know that because again, nice icy days outside. If I'm driving, I hit some black ice, I turn my wheel, my car doesn't turn, it just continues to go straight. Because without that static friction, my car is not going to turn at all. So again, static friction sometimes is very helpful, keeps us from falling off the roof, causes us to actually walk forward, causes our car to drive, so causes us to turn. Can I have a friction? Most of the time it's taking away energy, which means it causes it to slow down, causes it to stop, which in this case isn't exactly helpful. But, <clears throat> but doesn't mean it's always a bad thing. So, so this is friction. So this is the other type of force that we're gonna see. Now, let me go back here. Now again, these two are a little bit tricky, especially the static friction one. So static friction, Again, when it's always going to be true, you're going to be somewhere between zero and its maximum value. Don't always assume it's maximum. There has to be something in the wording that tells me it's maximum, as opposed to the kinetic friction, where the kinetic friction will always be this constant value of simply using case size and pole force. So what this means then is to determine fully what the friction force is, we have to use the sum of forces to determine the normal force, because the normal force, again, as I mentioned before, is purely dictated by each geometrical representation of the net forces acting on the system. So again, as I change my system, I change all the forces. I also then change the normal force.
So good. in the next video, we'll start looking at a whole bunch of examples of how do we use static friction? How do we use kinetic friction? How do we solve problems using Newton's second law? So we'll do that in the next video. So other nets, um, feel free to ask questions. I can leave them in comments and things like that. And yeah, we'll have, I think, one more video before I return to you guys on Monday.